All right. I'm going to do my best not to um, walk backwards and fall into the trough. <laughs> this is my secret fear. Every time we have a baptism, the secret fear is of the pastor, right? And it's, it, well, I, because, you know, you get excited. You go backwards like that. Just want to also let you know that Tony, Tony Federuso, who just was uh, baptized, and Randy Robinson, who had to work this morning, and he was like, so sorry, but he just got a job, so yay, right? <laughs> this is good. Um, both, both, both of them uh, were going to come into membership um, this morning as well, um, but since Randy um, isn't here this morning and he's going to be here tomorrow night at CR, we're going to take Randy and Tony into membership tomorrow at CR. So if any of you all want to be involved with that, come on down to CR tomorrow night and um, you'll be able to witness that as well or, or, or dial it up on you know, Facebook Live and we'll be able to see that too. All right, so one of my favorite places to visit, and I have talked to you about this before, is North Carolina. North Carolina. I love North Carolina. I've talked about it. I've talked about it. There is just something for me about the mountains um, and the trees, the waterfalls there. It just makes me happy. It just makes me happy to be in that place. I love to hike. And when I'm on top of that those mountains after just risking life and limb and sweat and probably some injuries to get there, I am just at my happiest. I just love it there. Now, I've shown you some pictures before of some of my North Carolina adventures, and um, this is not going to be any different. I'm going to show you another. Um, let me introduce you to my friend, Grandfather Mountain. Grandfather Mountain technically is in Linville, um, North Carolina, which, by the way, has the absolutely most awesome waterfall hike you can ever take called Linville Falls. It's amazing. But no township can actually um, hold the entirety um, of Grandfather's magnificence. I can tell you that because he is nestled right between the Blue Ridge Parkway with breathtaking panoramic uh, scenery around every bend. There's a picture of that as well. And also towns with rustic, beautiful, romantic names like Banner Elk and Blowing Rock. Grandfather towers 6,000 feet up and is part of the Appalachian Trail. And if you make it to the top, you'll find something cool, the Mile High Swinging Bridge. There's a picture of that, which is pretty hard. It is a heart-stopping experience to cross over this thing. The grandfather is estimated to be 300 million years old, with some of the oldest rock formations being almost 1.2 billion years old. That's pretty magnificent, if you ask me. It's and it's called Grandfather Mountain because the legend has it that if you view it in the right way, um, you can see the outline of a grandfather's face on its ridge. And so in the middle there, there's a little hump that's still like the nose, and the flat part is the forehead, and the bottom is the beard. I don't know if you can see it, but there you go. A little known fact about Grandfather Mountain is that some of the scenes in the movie Forrest Gump when, when Forrest is running across the country, right? <laughs> they are filmed on the winding roads of Grandfather Mountain. In fact, there's even a sign there that says Forrest Gump Curve. So I'm sure you can tell by now that I love the grandfather, and I, and, I, and I love that mountain no matter what the season is. The winters up there are astoundingly cold. The lowest temp ever recorded there was negative 32. I have hiked up there in the snow, and it'll scare you how rugged it is up there. And then I've hiked up there as well in the summer where it's so high up that it never gets warmer than 83 degrees. That was the highest degree ever recorded. I have loved my mountaintop experiences on that ridge. There's nothing like it, and I, and I can tell you all about it. And the reason I can is because I remember every detail. I remember every detail of the blood and the sweat and the tears that got me there. In fact, I kind of wish I was there right now. <laughs> I, I kind of I wish I was there right now. Talking about it makes me want to be there again and again. It's been many years, but eventually I had to come on down off that mountain into the real world, right? Have you ever had a mountaintop experience? I'm not talking necessarily by a real mountain. It doesn't have to be a real mountain. But, you know, there are those times in our lives when we, we wish they'd never end, and, and we look back with joy and maybe longing at them. It could be a time 
with someone you love that's over now. Maybe it's an award you once got or a job that you had was the best job ever or your long ago youth full of carefree fun or a time, maybe it's a time of emotional stability you had or, or it could be sobriety that now is a struggle when before it wasn't a struggle. Just that snap, I'm talking about that snapshot of life that was perfect and you wish you could just stay there forever. If you, if you can remember a mountaintop time or experience in your life, can you raise your hand? Can you raise your hand? Yeah, of course. Me too. But eventually, the real world, with all its struggles and chaos, beckons us back down uh, the path, doesn't it? We've got to come back down. You know, I've had these kind of mountaintop experiences with my faith as well. When my faith was younger and everything was brand new and so exciting and great time of passion for me. And maybe you've experienced that in your faith as well. In fact, I hope you're experiencing mountaintop, mountaintop faith right now. Um, it's so fun to be there. And those faith mountaintop experiences, they're important. They're important. Uh, they're necessary because they shape our relationship with God. In a moment or a season in time, our eyes get opened up because it's like amazing. God opens our eyes and we know, wow, God is here. God is real. Uh, Jesus is God come to earth to save us and to give us power and comfort and just wow, right? Jesus is here. Jesus is real. He loves me and he loves you. He loves everybody and just wow. Mountaintop experiences are amazing. We've all had them. The difficulty with them, of course, is that they always pass and we don't like that part. <laughs> we don't like that part. We, we always have to come down off the mountain into the real world. I, for one, would like to stay on the mountain forever. <laughs> and here's the deal. So did Jesus' disciples back in the day. And we're going to hear about that today. We've been in this series um, of Sunday messages lately in the Bible Gospel Book of Mark, um, where Jesus' follower named Mark tells his story of Jesus. Talk about a mountaintop experience, right? I mean, actually walking and talking and living with Jesus, like actually being with Jesus, like in the flesh, in real time. Holy cow, right? I mean, the disciples had a mac daddy of mountaintop experiences, walking, talking, learning, watching, living with Jesus. I'm, I'm absolutely positive that they thought this time would never end. It would just keep being mountaintop forever higher and higher with feeling safe and close and confident and hopeful and strong with the Messiah of the world. Yay. You know, so far in this last 10 Sundays in this message series that we're calling Good News, we've seen Jesus' disciple travel with him as he did so many things, as he healed people, brought people back from the dead, taught God's truths, challenged the authorities of government and religion both. He cast out demons, fed thousands with just a few loaves of bread and a few fishes come, the very forces of nature when he commanded the seas to stop storming, and more. And as they experienced all of this, the disciples, I would think, naturally thought that Jesus had come to set all the wrongs of their first century world right and set them free from the bondage of Rome and the powers of government that were oppressing the Jews. Yeah! Yeah! I mean, that's what the hope of a Messiah had always been for the Jewish people. That kind of strong, authoritative king, just like when, just like, because they remember, they remember the stories, just like when Moses had centuries before, the father of their faith, Moses had centuries before led the Israelites out of bondage of Egypt into the promised land. Just like the great prophet Elijah had strongly done miracles and literally called down fire from the heavens in a showdown between false gods and the real God and had been taken up to heaven without dying himself. Just like all of that, now the disciples thought Jesus was here to do the same thing as the great Moses and Elijah had done only now in their present time. Yeah, the Messiah had finally come, just as predicted by these fathers of the faith. However, their thought of who the Savior was versus the reality of what the Messiah actually ended up being and doing was beginning to be a little bit of a rude awakening to them. Over the past couple of Sundays, if you've been here, you've been with us as we've read about how Jesus has been slowly 
turning his disciples to the truth of who he is, what he actually came to do, and what it means to follow him. He's a king, but he's a different kind of king. Not king of the government of man, but king of heaven and earth. He has a kingdom, yes, but it's a different kind of kingdom. Not with rules of success and power, but with grace and mercy. Amen. And we're to be his disciples, you bet, but different kinds of disciples. Not the first and the best, but the last and the least and the lowly. And the winning moment in this Messiah's story, his story of glory, man, it's not going to happen by reaching the mountaintop. No, actually it's going to end on a cross. Down with the broken world. Amongst the sin and the suffering there. And with an invitation for those who follow him to take up their cross into that same sin and suffering of the world very far from a mountaintop experience. So today, again, we're going to see how Jesus tries to show his disciples who he is and what following him means. And this next part happens, believe it or not, on a mountain. <laughs> it happens on a mountain. Let me set the stage, okay? This is what has happened. Jesus has just asked his disciples who they believed he was, and Peter says, you're the son of God. Bingo! Peter, you got it right. And then Jesus told them he'd have to suffer and die, and Peter says, no, 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 no. He argues with Jesus about this. Obviously still not completely picking up what Jesus is throwing down, okay? So here's what happens next. Let's read it together, Mark 9, 2 through 4. It's on the screen. Go. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Now, the word transfigured means simply changed from one thing to another. Now, this doesn't mean that Jesus changed, actually changed to something else. It's just that his earthly appearance was changed to show who really he was, God. And the disciples are there. They figure they've reached the pinnacle with, with, with Jesus. Jesus and his peeps, they're all together now, right? The three big dogs, right? Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. You know, I've always wondered, actually, um, this is an aside, but I've always wondered, actually, how the disciples knew that these guys were Moses and Elijah. I mean, there were no photographs, right? I mean, how did they, how did they know? But, but obviously, they somehow did know. Jesus had set this stage for them. I just want you to imagine for a minute, if you were these disciples, you have reached the top now all the greats in one place. You are there. Here's the deal, though. Peter, James, and John see Jesus as one of the great three. I think they still miss the point. They may have forgotten their Torah studies when they were younger. That's told them when Moses went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, God showed his faith. And Moses hid his face from the dazzling light, terrified. The same dazzling light that's now upon Jesus on this mountain. Jesus was definitely not the equal of Moses and Elijah. Oh, no. Jesus is the Son of God. The same God who showed his face to Moses. The same God who gave Elijah the power to call down fire on false gods. That's who Jesus is. See, Jesus is showing his friends again on this mountain who he is. Seeing an Elijah and Moses was the greatest mountaintop experience that these three could ever, could ever have. And I'd like to think that they were going to need this experience. They were going to need this mountaintop experience when things were going to get hard because they were about to get hard. They would need to reach back and remember that they were there. And they saw with their own eyes that Jesus was even the king of Moses and Elijah. Have you ever needed to reach back and remember? Have you ever needed to reach back and remember the confirmation that God is good, that he loves you, that he has all things under control, 
that in the face of whatever it is that you need to reach back and remember this? You know, I tell you all a lot that I am in recovery from drugs and alcohol, living a daily 12-step recovery program for the past 36 years. And I remember my earlier recovery when I realized that God had lifted the merciless obsession for drugs and alcohol from me. It was a miracle. It was a miracle. And everything was just brand new. In recovery lingo, sometimes that's called the pink cloud. But I, can I also tell you that in the ensuing 36 years, there have been many low valleys and tragedy, years of trudging the road of happy destiny rather than skipping along it. There have. I mean, lots of times if you're in recovery, these hard times can cause a disillusionment in you and you end up turning your back on recovery. But that's the wrong response, friends. Recovery isn't lived on the mountaintops. Recovery is lived in real life. With the, what those early mountaintop experiences do is remind me and strengthen me as I travel along real life. You can't camp on the mountain. That's not what the mountain's for. But the disciples, like us, they want to. They want to camp on the mountain of transfiguration. This was the peak of what they had hoped in their life by following Jesus. They had arrived, and they want to stay there. I mean, who wouldn't? Here's what happened next. Mark 9, 5 through 7. It's on the screen. Can you read this next part with me as well? Go. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Now, the first part of this is kind of funny, I think. Mark's gospel tells us that Peter says, it's so good to be where they're at that they should just stay. Let's just stay. He says, let's build some houses and live here. One for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And then Mark writes um, in the gospel, he says, oh, well, like the parentheses, oh, you know, Peter, <laughs> he's just talking just to talk. <laughs> you know, he just talks. Ever do that? Ever get in a situation to talk just to have, have something to say, right? Have something to fill in the gap? But, but what, what comes out of Peter actually shows that Peter doesn't really understand Jesus yet. See, this experience isn't, some successful coup. You know, we get to live on the mountain with Jesus. <laughs> no, this is just to show them again who Jesus is. They're not supposed to live there. They're supposed to be empowered there. You know, I don't know if you've ever tried to cast back to the past for your mountaintop moments, wishing you could live there and recreate them. But maybe, maybe it can change the way you think of them. Maybe these amazing memories are ways that Jesus used to fill you up and give you strength for the rest of the journey of ups and downs. See, because life is lived out in real life with everyday people. You know, in recovery, I just told someone I sponsored the other day that you can only live one day at a time. You can't actually travel into the past or the future. But you can take every strengthening experience that God has provided in the past and use it for your present. Without those filling times, we would never be filled for when we're being emptied. Hear that again. Without those filling times, we'd never be filled for when we're being emptied. And here's the deal. If you are trudging through the valley today, living life on life's terms, knowing that God is there, know, just know that God has daily experiences for you with him. Just know that. The dailiness is the point. The traveling with him through every moment is the point. It was the point for the disciples as well. The mountain was going to inspire them, sure, but as they slowly realized that Jesus was leading them to be servants rather than dignitaries, to be last rather than be first, to be bringers of peace rather than the sore, 
They would also need that daily infusion of Jesus to see them through that. You know, I don't know if you've noticed this or not. I'm sure you have. But being a follower of Jesus doesn't keep the bad stuff and the hard stuff from happening. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't keep the hurting things and the boring things and the confusing things and the suffering things and the things that simply are beyond comprehension and simply just plain wrong from happening. Just being a follower of Jesus doesn't keep addicts from dying and children from being sold in slavery and wars from happening to innocent countries. It doesn't prevent pandemics and it doesn't prevent senseless death and profound grief. I want to share with you that our friend Tom March went to be with Jesus this past week. Being a follower of Jesus does not prevent the pain of this. But being a follower of Jesus does give us strength in the journey. Here's our main idea for today. It's on the screen. Can you say it with me? Jesus' power on the mountaintop leads me to listen to him in the valley of everyday life. Because let me take a minute here and encourage you, your soul needs fresh encounters and experiences with God in order to grow. The mountaintop emotionalism is great, but to move from a soul that's barely surviving to magnificently living, it takes creating space for regular, everyday, ordinary encounters with God. Our God is a God of daily provision, not stockpiling to last for months. There's a reason that as Moses led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, that God provided manna to fall down every day to feed them. He didn't send a monthly package to be stored in the fridge. Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread so that our souls might live off of what God is doing in our lives right now, not just back then. You know, in recovery, I see people get in trouble all the time, trying to live today off of yesterday's recovery. Yesterday's sobriety is not enough to keep you sober today. There are steps and processes, steps and processes we engage in daily to stay fresh and strong and connected to God for whatever comes to pass. And in our Christ following lives in general, this is true too. Today's strength, today's community, today's devotions, today's prayers won't do you a hill of beans next month when life shows up. If you didn't seek Jesus in between now and then, can I hear amen? amen. But hopefully the mountaintop experiences will remind you to surrender to Jesus and pick up your cross and carry it in faith each and every day. So say it with me again. It's on the screen. Go. Jesus' power on the mountaintop leads me to listen to him in the valley of everyday life. And that's precisely what God said to Peter, James, and John on that mountaintop that day. Remember, we just read it, but we're going to read it again. The end of Mark 9, Mark 9, 7. Let's go. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Here they are with Moses and Elijah, the greatest men of their Jewish faith who they had followed for centuries. And God says, listen to Jesus. God is saying, this isn't just another great rabbi, boys. This is my son, God in the flesh, backed by Moses and Elijah. God tells them, listen to him. Not just in this moment, but in the future moment and in the past moment and in all the moments for all time and the good and the bad and the happy and the sad on the mountaintop in the valleys with the rich and the famous and with the last and the least and the lost. Listen to him for what has happened, for what is to come. Listen to him, only him. And guess what he's telling us as well? He's saying, listen to him. It's a simple message, isn't it? Listen to him. So, what happens next to Jesus and the disciples after this mountaintop moment? Well, they come down off the mountain. That's it. Let us pray. No fanfare. Instead of staying up on the mountain in the midst of the amazing glory-filled moment, it was time to come down. 
Because for Jesus and the disciples, there was real life full of, real life full of people who were lost. This ex experience wasn't meant to keep them on the mountain, no. But to fuel them in such a deep way that they lived differently below in real life. And friends, that's God's will for us today too. One more time, let's say it on the screen. Here it is. Jesus' power on the mountaintop leads me to listen to him in the valley of everyday life. Listen to Jesus. How do we do that? Read his word. Trust his promises. Don't give up. Keep on walking, trusting, believing one day at a time every day, calling on the strength of the mountaintops and relying on the daily practices of faith. Because listening requires being intentional with our discipline. Because if we're not careful, we can easily end up letting God's voice just become the white noise, just one of many, many voices that we hear in, in the soundtrack of our lives. Listen to him. He's with us in the everyday, walking alongside us. How amazing is God that he would come down from the mountain and walk with us among a bruised, bullying, and broken people. See, the goal of the world, if you're, if you're walking with the world, the goal of the world is to make it out of the real world and into the mountain for reputation and success for ourselves. But the will of God is to step down from the mountain into the real life for the benefit of others. Crazy, wonderful things happen when we listen to Jesus and come down off that mountain. Let me tell you about it. We go into real life and the lost become found. We go into the rubble of real life and the destroyed get redeemed. When we listen to him, we go into real life with humility that becomes strength. We go into the real life of humanity's despair and we bring his hope. We go into the real life of the world's worry and we find his peace. For those of us in recovery, let me make it really clear, okay? Okay. As we're looking for God's will, to follow God's will, well, following Jesus is following God. That's for all of us, friends. In step 11, we saw through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Carry it out where? In real life. Not up on the mountain, but down here. And then step 12 says that having had a spiritual awakening, we tried to carry the message in real life to real people and practice these principles where? In all our affairs, in real life. What is the message that we carry? Whatever Jesus is saying. We listen to him. Jesus himself shows us how to live as his disciple down in real world by how he spent his time raising a dead child, dealing with grieving parents, helping people with not enough faith, healing a woman with a bleeding disorder, working on demon-possessed people. That's how our Messiah spends his time, and God says, listen to him. And guess what? When we do it, it's a joy. It's a joy. We come to Jesus for ourselves, and we stay with him through helping others. We look for the mountaintop, and then we find true contentment in the daily real-life walk with our Savior and Messiah Jesus, and daily bringing his love to others who are in need of a mountaintop experience. And Jesus is with us always, and it is a joy. And so I say to Tony, wherever he is, enjoy the mountaintop today. Keep it, cherish it, and now turn and walk in the ways of your Savior, Jesus, always. And for all of us, there's still work to be done in the everyday life of bringing the kingdom of Jesus to everyday life. In fact, here's a picture of downtown Fort Myers. Here's the drone shot of your mission field, okay, as you follow Jesus down the mountain and daily follow him. There it is. That's Fort Myers from the heavens, right? There's plenty still to be done in real life. One more time, it's on the screen, let's say it. Jesus' power on the mountaintop leads me to listen to him in the valley of everyday life. God is waiting to lead us down the mountain into the valley of real life on mission for him. And that's where you become his disciple. Store those mountaintop experiences, friends. You're gonna need them. Listen to him each and every day. Find him in the everyday people in need of a savior that you happen to know. Lay down your life and your goals and your plans and pick up your cross. And P.S., your cross, 
Your cross is a life of listening to a Savior that loves you and listen to him, listening to him tell you, love people that I love in my name. Listen to him. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, we're listening to you because we need you. But Lord, we're also listening to you because we hear you call us. Call us out of the mundane of the everyday. Not longing for what happened in the past. Not longing for something more than you've given us today. But grateful that we can reach back for the experiences, mountaintop experiences we've had with you. But more grateful that you've had us filled with these so that we can serve you today. God, we're listening. We're listening. We know it's not all about us. We know it's all about you and the people you love. God, help us in our dailyness, in our daily listening to your son, Jesus Christ. Help us in doing that every single day, not expecting to do this once or twice or to be close to you for a moment or two and then wondering where you are the rest of the time, but walking with you all the time. God, we ask that you bless people who are hurting today. We know that the valley is the valley because it's the valley. But God, we know that you walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death even. And so we ask that you strengthen the people who are hurting today. Let them know that you're here and that you're real. And as we sing our, this next song, God, we, we ask that you meet them at this altar if they need to come to the altar. If they need somebody to pray with them, they can raise their hand. God, we're grateful for what we've heard today. Uh, let us put it into practice. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The altar is open.